Hello everyone and welcome to the official podcast of BNI Success Link. Today we are going to talk about buying and selling your home using crypto. The official podcast of BNI Success Link. Your link to success. Hello again everyone. I'm your host Rav Mandiratha from Socio Squares and Landing Leads is where my business leads. Today we are going to talk about a very exciting topic buying and selling your home using crypto and i have an expert with me today faramars moenziai faramars thank you so much for doing this oh my pleasure thanks rav why don't we start with you give us a short introduction about yourself your company and your mm, adventures with crypto sure sure so i work at uh, cross country mortgage i'm a branch manager here in berkeley and um, I've been in the mortgage business for 18 years. I specialize in residential mortgage. Uh, that's usually properties that are one to four units. Anything above four units is commercial and we don't do commercial. Uh, we work with uh, buyers who are first time buyers. We work with seasoned investors and everything in between. So houses, you know, anywhere from, it's hard to find them here, but anywhere from 100, 200,000, we work in all 50 states. So we see that sometimes, but all the way up to, you know, two, three million, four million dollars in this area. That's amazing. So in 18 years, I'm sure you've seen the entire gamut of, of residential mortgages. And today you is an lot. exciting time. <laughs> so before we come to crypto, in general, the market has been so hot and there are a lot of talks around interest rates. So why don't you give us a little overview of what to expect in 2022? Sure, sure. Yeah. In 2021, we saw a record increase in home prices, which really impacted a lot of buyers. We had an 18% increase nationally and locally here in the Bay Area it was, you know, not too dissimilar. So uh, coming out of COVID, everybody was enjoying the record low interest rates, a lot of bidding up over asking prices. And we saw a big shift in the market. That's really continued this year. Uh, in December, the Federal Reserve announced that they're going to raise rates three times this year and probably three times next year. And this is to battle inflation. And that's something that we were expecting. You know, they, they've been saying this uh, for at least the last year. Uh, at every single one of their meetings, they've been saying that at the end of the pandemic, when we transition back to a more normal economy, there should be some supply chain issues, which will result in what they felt was going to be periodic inflation. And they weren't too worried about it. In December, we had some data come out that not only were the home prices going up, not only were the price of goods and services going up in general, but wage growth was way more than what they had expected, about a 12% wage increase, which was really, really high. So it, that really supports not just a periodic inflation due to supply chain, but perhaps longer term inflation. So they did get more aggressive than expected. The markets have really responded to this right away. Um, the bond markets in January and, and early February we've gone up about a percent in rate, pretty much pricing in what they expect the Fed to do this year. And I mean, that's that's the one thing that a lot of people misunderstand is that by the time the Federal Reserve moves the interest rate, the markets have already priced it in. And it's not uncommon when on the day of the Federal Reserve meeting, when they actually announce the rate increase, we might actually have rates go down a little bit because their commentary might not be as hawkish as people might have been worrying about. That's interesting. So even though the market is pricing it in, you, you feel that the interest rate might might come down a little bit or they might stay where they are? It's possible. You know, the, there's one Fed Reserve member, Bullard, who ha wants a 50 basis point hike in March. Uh, everybody's expecting 25 in March. Most of the Fed governors, the, the people who sit on the board, are supportive of a 25 basis point increase. So that's expected. That's priced into the market right now. What we're really going to be watching is their commentary based on what they expect to happen further into this year and into next year. Got it. All right. That's interesting. And maybe we'll do another session after this has happened yeah. and, and see where the market is going then. So today, let's focus on crypto. And why don't we start with you share your experience so far? What are you seeing? Are buyers asking for paying by crypto? Are seller expecting to be paid in crypto? How's that market evolving? Sure. Yeah. So we've seen, you know, it's a new thing. So five years ago, this was not even a discussion topic, but certainly in the last couple of years, especially last year with the escalation of the, of the Bitcoin and Ethereum assets, uh, a lot of people ended up with a lot of cash. And when they were competing in this hot housing market, they were trying to scrape together everything they can. 
So there's two big distinctions. So on the buyer side, the question is, can I use my cryptocurrency to buy a home? And the answer is yes, as long as you first move it to cash. So the, the, the source being crypto, we treat it just like we would stocks, mutual funds, things like that. It still has to be liquidated and turned into cash before you can use it as a source of your down payment if you're getting a loan. Right. So if, you, if your plan is to put 20 percent down, 30 percent down, some of that money is coming from cryptocurrency. As long as you've had ownership of it for the last couple of months, we get your Coinbase statement or wherever you're holding it. And then you, we, we've sourced this, the liquidation and the transfer to your account. You can use it as a down payment. This, the, the second question, which really impacts the seller side, is what if I don't want to get a loan? What if I just want to use, you know, I have two million dollars of Bitcoin and I want to buy a house with that? The issue there becomes escrow. So escrow is the neutral third party that represents both the buyer and seller in any transaction usually. Um, normally, and the reason that escrow exists is that normally because you're dealing with such large denominations, you end up looking at each other saying, okay, who's going to do what first? First you give me the money, then I'll sign the deed over to you. Well, if you give me the money and I never sign the deed, then You've got my money and I have no house, but if I sign the deed over and you never give me the money, now you have the legal right to the house and I don't have the money. So escrow handles the transaction. They receive the money from the buyer and then when all funds are in, they release all of the documents to be reported at the county and they disperse the funds to the seller. That's where we don't really have a solution for, for a pure crypto transaction because the title companies, Chicago Title, First American, Old Republic, Placer Title, all these different title companies that exist, I, there, there's, there's a couple that have popped up saying that they'll do crypto, but they're not really well established. And I haven't seen a single transaction where you can truly take Bitcoin, let's say Bitcoin is $50,000 per coin, and you want to buy a house for a million dollars, where you're literally just transferring 20 coins from the buyer to the seller using blockchain technology. There's some liquidation into US dollars and then a transfer over to escrow and then a transfer back to the, the seller. So that's the, that's the challenge right now is that, you know, we have definitely evolving markets on the crypto side, a lot of trading, a lot of lending, a lot of transactions that occur on the crypto side of things. But in terms of the real estate market, there's a couple of holes missing here where you're going to be forced to turn that money into US dollars before you can actually conclude your transaction. Got it. So would you say that we are about 70% there if you want to do a crypto only transaction, but there are some yeah. missing parts and we might yeah. be there soon? You know, that's the whole purpose of blockchain, right? right. Is, to, is to create a secure transaction like this. So Title and escrow provide a couple of services. One is that neutral third party. The second is that they do a background search on the, on the property to make sure that there's no liens on it, that the person selling the home is actually the legal owner of the home. Uh, we're not dealing with something where four siblings inherited their parents' property. One of them is selling it, but they actually don't have the right to. All that kind of stuff gets covered by your title insurance. There's been a lot of talk around using blockchain technology to make that seamless because that's what, that's what that technology is there for, right? To guarantee the identity, to guarantee the security, to guarantee that the data is pure and, and not adulterated, right? So... So if we get into that, then that's a major change in the title and escrow business. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some companies popping up, like I said, nothing major, but mm -hmm. I think we're starting to see the beginnings of it. So in terms of, you know, a percentage of what's missing, I think, you know, if the seller's willing to accept it, the buyer's willing to give it, we're probably 75% there. That missing 25% that was big, because it's a deal stopper right now. Got it. So a couple of news items which have come in in the media that people have converted their homes into NFTs and the purchaser has bought the NFTs. They might be outliers at this stage and the regular transactions which are more commonplace with the title and escrow, those are yet to happen fully on blockchain. That's right. That's right. And so I think, I think the question with the NFT is what data is included, right? Can you guarantee on that NFT the secure transfer of title? Because what you're buying as a buyer when you buy title insurance, so on a million dollar house, you're going to pay, let's say, $2,000 for a title insurance policy. 
That means for the life of your loan, that it, that title company guarantees that there's not going to be any issues with the lien, uh, with liens, with people coming back and saying money is owed, with the guarantee that that's the owner of the property selling it to you, that you know the property lines are correctly mapped and all that stuff. So if that's if all that data is included in that token. Right. If if you can somehow get that guarantee from the seller, the seller would essentially be providing you that title insurance. But then what's your recourse? Right. If the seller sells you the home a year later, things pop up that were guaranteed not to happen, like somebody claiming they own it should have never been sold. Can you go back to the seller? Do they have the the, pocket, the deep pockets to be able to make you whole in those situations? Right. So. Mm. I think that's where the questions lie. I, I would I would imagine that where this will all land is that homes will probably have that type of NFT digital certification, but that it would come from the title company. Because, you know, the same reason, you know, I you, you wouldn't come to me for your home insurance because I don't have enough money to rebuild your house if the if the ten houses burn down, right? You use an insurance company that's regulated and all that stuff. And I think the dream of you know, cryptocurrency and blockchain of open markets and, you know, having no currency issues tied with countries and things like that. Part of that is also wanting to get rid of this infrastructure, all these different third parties that get involved, me included, right, in the whole transaction. If you can just kind of transact mm -hmm. um, using the digital currency, using the blockchain where you're guaranteed all of the same guarantees that you have right now in a traditional transaction. I think that's where they would like to take that. Right, right. That's interesting. I have one final question for you, and I got to ask this just because I'm yeah. into digital marketing. What is the best digital marketing strategy, or what is one digital marketing strategy that works for you? Well, I think I've got to kick that back to you. For me, because I work 100% by referral. You know, I don't. We don't do lead. Type stuff where you're not going to hear you're not going to ever going to hear Fairmars Moenzi on the radio or put on a billboard. It doesn't market that well, right? People get a little scared off by all the letters. So we work pretty much 100% by referral. So for me, it's basically making sure that people who are looking for me can find me. So I'd say search engine optimization is really important. Um, linking to you know really investing into social networks where you are viewed as an expert someone who's reliable someone who knows what they're talking about so other people in your network can refer you those types of things seem to work best in, in my type of platform because we're not going for you know we don't have a call center where we want all of a sudden a million phones ringing at the same time so in a way you're saying that being top of on the search results is important that gets you yeah. that could get you calls and being present on social networks and building a thought leadership there would get you that reputation for people to trust you and give you business. Yeah, so, and I think that you have to come up with an overall digital strategy, right? Yeah. So it's great when someone finds you but then where does that lead, right? Yeah. So yeah. how robust is your website? How yeah. how when they find your name, will it lead to a hundred five-star Yelp reviews or a hundred five-star Google reviews? When they do find you, what then does that lead to? Instead of just your name popping up, can you digitally market yourself to the point where someone feels compelled to have enough trust in you to actually reach out and contact you for a result of that? Right. And, and I must say, you have done a brilliant job on that and your team as well. You have a great looking website. Thanks. And you have great reviews across various platforms, Zillow, Yelp, Google as well. So kudos to you and your team for doing that. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're super excited to be working with you on the next phase of this. So we're very excited about that. Great. Faramas, thank you so much for doing this session. I, these are some great insights. And I hope crypto becomes uh, the end-to-end -end solution soon. But it doesn't that, replace yeah, anybody. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't replace anybody. Uh, yeah. I think mm, that mutual trust, which which comes in with uh, uh, with all the key people involved, is required for such a large, large transaction. So, I think we're going to get there. Yeah, I, I really do think that that's where, at least as an option, you know, it's got to become available as an option where people don't have to liquidate there because then you pay capital gains on on whatever gain you've made and all that stuff if you can truly transact coin to coin then i think that i think there's going to be enough demand where that's probably going to happen sometime in the near future 
right and our next session would be around that That's time right. on that subject. That's right. <laughs> Thank you so much Faramaz. This my was pleasure. a great session. My pleasure Rob. Thank you. The official podcast of BNI Success Link. Your link to success.